thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video we're going to be going over our first bit of 40k Tactica. I don't want to completely call it a Tactica video because this is more about the structure of how a, an army is built, and uh, there there will probably be some more stuff like that in the future with other codexes that come out, uh, and tactics are definitely something that I look forward to exploring, battle reports too. But for this one, we're just going to be talking about one of the more complex parts of building a Necron army, and maybe that should help out some newer players who might be a little confused on how this dynasty stuff works. So when building a Necron army, you've got to select a dynastic code for it. You don't have to select a dynastic code. There's other ways you can do this, but the, for, for the purposes of this video, we're just going to go with the dynastic codes. And they apply to the Necron units that have the dynasty keyword as long as all models in that detachment are from the same dynasty. This allows any bonuses or rules that come with the chosen dynasty to apply to those dynasty keyword units. You'll notice that several models, mostly characters, have the keyword Dynasty Agent. This keyword allows you to include them without breaking your Dynastic Code de detachment, but some of the characters do have a specific Dynasty keyword. Uh, Vargard Oberon is an example. So instead of the Dynasty Agent keyword, they've got their you know specific Dynasty that's listed there. So it's important to pay attention to those keywords as you're building your army. One of the things that I noticed while trying to build some of my first armies in this codex was that there are a couple components that come with selecting a dynastic code, and they aren't all in the same space. So I wanted to create this video to outline all the options that come with a dynasty in one package with a slight overview on what those dynasties are pointed at play-wise, and that should give you a good idea of how you're going to be creating your Necron lists. Before we dive into these dynasties, let's touch on the framework of them. There are four pieces that factor into picking your ready-made dynasty. Dynastic codes that will blank blanket your army with some special rules, dynastic stratagems, dynastic warlord traits, and an interaction with how command protocols work for you. You could argue that there's a fifth in determining which characters you'd like to get access to, uh, but currently this only comes up with Imhotek the Stormlord, Nemesir Zandric, and Vargard Oberon, since they all have the Sawtek keyword and lack dynastic agent. With that out of the way, let's head into the breakdown of each dynasty. The Mephrit Dynastic Code adds 3 inches to the range of all of your non-pistol weapons and lets you get plus 1 to your armor penetration stat when you're within half the total range of your weapon. For, for clarification's sake, the additional range alters your weapon range profile, so that plus 3 will factor into your half range for the extra AP. As an example, a Gauss Flare would go from 24 inch range to 27 inch range, so you'd get the rapid fire bonus and the AP bonus on targets within 13 and a half inches of the shooting model. The final dynastic code bonus is an interaction with a specific command protocol. The elevator pitch of command protocols is that you can pick five from a selection of six and each go off at the start of a battle round in the order you've secretly selected before the game. Each directive has two options that you get to pick between when they come up. The directive you or the directive you select broadcasts a rule to your characters that turns into an aura. Uh, there's a lot more to command protocols, both rules and strategy, so if you'd like a video on those specifically, leave a comment below to let me know that you'd like my take on that component of Necrons. So with that tangent out of the way, the bonus for Mephrit is that when Protocol of the Vengeful Stars comes up, you can select both directives, instead of one, as long as your army is made up of the Mephric, or Mephric Dynastic Code. This excludes Dynastic Agents and Satan Shards, uh, so you aren't punished for including those at all. And Vengeful Stars is a shooting-based protocol. It get, Directive 1 gives your unmodified range rolls of 6 an additional AP, while Directive 2 lets you ignore the cover bonus uh, to armor saves if you're within half range while shooting. Choosing Mephrit also gives you access to a unique strategic ploy stratagem, Talent for Annihilation. For one command point, each time you choose a Mephrit unit uh, to make a shooting attack, 
each unmodified roll of six inflicts an additional mortal wound, but you can only ever get three additional wounds per phase off this stratagem. Mefford also gains access to the Conduit of Stars Relic. This replaces the Roy Royal Warden's Relic Goss Blaster to increase the range, rapid fire, and strength of the weapon to 36 inches, rapid fire 3, strength 6 with the same AP of 2, and damage 2. The final unique bonus for Mefret is opening up the Merciless Tyrant Warlord trait. This adds plus 1 strength and attack characteristic to your Warlord's profile. Overall, Mefret is really pointed at increasing your shooting game. The extra range is a pretty big buff to the army when you want to gun things down as quickly as possible. The smaller the gap between your opponent and your gun line, the more you want to make sure your shots are counting, and the extra AP gets you closer to that goal while synergizing with the bonus range from the Dynastic Code. Getting both the directives on Vengeful Stars is also a pretty big deal, as there's never really a time when both of those aren't relevant, and it can be hard to pick between the two otherwise. The only tough part is figuring out where to seed it to get the most out of it. I think it'll live in the turn 3 slot, but that all depends on how aggressive your opponent is, how, forward you're, how far forward you're pushing, and a couple other factors too. The Warlord trait's the only thing that feels a bit out of place here since it's a heavily melee-focused one, but if you think of the early turns being used to clear away the middle of the table to make it safe for your fighty warlord, then you'll appreciate the buffs and they'll be welcome if uh, something crashes into your gun line early, allowing your warlord to get some extra work done in close combat. The stratagem feels a bit flat since you're spending one CP for the chance to get three mortal wounds, but if you've got the CP to spare and you want to lower or you want your lower strength shots to punch above their weight class, it's not a bad uh, avenue to do that. Uh, it's just more corner case. I do think the special relic is cool, and the Royal Warden works really well in this dynasty, but there are a few Necron relics that usually take my free slot, and I don't know yet if it's worth paying the extra control point to get access to this gun. Overall, Mefret is a strong choice if you want your shooting to have some extra spice on it, it definitely helps to point your list building in a certain direction with this dynasty, leaning more on the shooting from your troops, but I think the bonuses you get in shooting will help make the way safe for your melee-centric options if you're not completely put in that gun line box with, with your list build. The Nefric Dynastic Code gives all models in the code a 6 plus invulnerable save to increase the army's durability. You'll also get a unique movement benefit that lets you translocate when you advance, so you don't make a roll for the advance and you just add 6 inches to the move characteristic of the unit. The trade-off is that you can't shoot after having used translocate instead of advancing. Uh, it is worth noting that this benefit is something you can choose between when advancing or wanting to translocate, so you can still take advantage of those assault weapons if you don't mind giving up some speed. You also get another movement trick with Nefric that allows you to ignore models and terrain when you fall back or translocate. The Dynastic Code also gives you access to both directives for Protocol of the Sudden Storm. Directive 1 gives the unit plus 1 to their move characteristic, and Directive 2 allows you to make ranged attacks after performing actions without that action failing. Nefric gives you the translo Translocation Crypt War Gear Stratagem for 1 CP. You use this when you're declaring reserves and who's in what transport to pick one non-vehicle or mon non-monster unit to gain uh, dimensional translocation. This ability allows you to set the unit up anywhere on the table during a movement phase as long as it's 9 inches away, more than 9 inches away from an opponent. Basically just you get to choose a unit to deep strike that wouldn't normally get to do it. The Nefric Relic is the solar staff that replaces the Staff of Light. This staff has increased shooting range to 24 inches over that 18 inches and doubles the shots to 6, but that's all the alteration we get to the profile. It does add the ability blind to infantry units that uh, if it hits any of those, you take away their option to use overwatch or set to defend. The dynasty-specific warlord trait, Skin of Living Gold, makes the warlord hard to land attacks on by subtracting one from the enemy's hit roll. Uh, now, Nefric is an interesting dynasty. I think it plays around with the with movement quite a bit and has a small debuff feel to it. Uh, 
between the relic and the warlord trait, but I feel like it's going to be left behind from the others since a lot of the other dynasty or dynasty benefits uh, depend on how the table is set up. Uh, if you've got obstructions, you can translocate or fall back over uh, just to get into really annoying places. Uh, you can also stretch your opponents out by kind of playing this weird positioning game, but it seems to take a lot of effort and luck to get it to work out for you. Uh, I could easily see this being a sleeper dynasty that might come up in power as the addition evolves, but its game plan isn't extremely direct in how you contort the bonuses to your advantages. I do think it competes with our next dynasty for playing the objective-focused game, though, so it'll be interesting to see how this one shakes out in the future. Now this next dynasty is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to say it the way I think it should be said, but the dynastic code for Nihilok starts out with giving every, object, every unit objective secured, and if a unit already had that ability, it counts as an additional model for that role. So like uh, a unit of 20 Necron warriors would end up counting as 40 Necron warriors for the purpose of objective secured since they already have that ability. They also have the ability to ignore the AP values of one, if the unit happens to be completely within your deployment zone when it gets hit. You also get to select both directives for the protocol of the Eternal Guardian. Directive 1 states that if a unit didn't move, advance, or fall back during this battle round, it benefits from light cover. Directive 2 allows you to use the hold steady or set to defend special rule when charged, so you are either hitting your overwatch on fives or you get to add one to your attack characteristic until the end of the next fight phase, but you give up your overwatch to do this. The unique stratagem available to this dynasty is Reclaim a Lost Empire. For one control point, you can select one Nihilok infantry and uh, in the shooting phase and that, that happens to be performing an action, and then they can shoot without having that action fail. The Nihilok Relic infinity mantle has no restriction outside the normal relic rules and adds one to the saving throw of the model equipped with it uh, it also lets them ignore wounds on a six after they've gone through your save so like a six plus feel no pain the dynasty specific warlord trait precognate a uh, pre precognitive strike allows you to or it allows your warlord to fight first if they're within engagement range of an enemy unit Nihilok is all about holding the line. Uh, between their Relic and the Warlord trait, you get a pretty proactive Warlord that's tough to get rid of. Uh, that's also backed up by troops that will keep your objectives from ever being contested and allows you to kind of take some away from your opponent. You'll also get the ability to use your models offensively while they are taking actions, and that makes your secondaries uh, less of a decision at, and more at the cost of just control points you know you don't have to like make your you don't have to make a sacrifice for one or the other i think this dynasty is going to be a very common one since a ninth edition stresses the importance of scenario play it isn't enough to just blast your opponent off the table when they are stacking points in such an efficient way what Nihilok lacks in punching power they make up in the ability to dig into the objectives and tick those points up aggressively i think the Nihilok dynasty brings uh, what it, it sacrifices quite a bit of the pointed combat output that a lot of the other dynasties kind of bolster, but it's not a big deal because the Necron Codex has quite a bit of combat efficiency just baked into its units already, that you can make the Nihilok dynasty army very uh, flexible and can get it to do all sorts of things at once without having to really dig deep into those uh, dynasty-specific benefits from some of the other ones. The dynastic code benefits for Novak add one to the charge rolls made for any unit with this code, and each time they make a melee attack after charging, or being charged, or uh, making a heroic intervention, the unit improves their AP by one. Additionally, they get both directives for a Protocol of the Hungry Void. Directive one improves the AP of attacks that roll an unmodified six by one, while directive two adds plus one strength to the units that charged, were charged, or made a heroic intervention. The Novak Stratagem Blood Rites costs one control point and allows you to pick a Novak unit in the fight phase and increase their attack characteristic by one. The dynasty-specific relic, the Blood Scythe, replaces a Void Scythe or a War Scythe, 
and has the same profile as a war scythe, but lets you make two additional attacks when you fight with the weapon. Blood-Fueled Fury is the Novak Warlord trait, and allows your unmodified wound rolls of 6 to inflict an additional mortal wound on top of your normal damage. The Novak Dynasty code is all about pushing the combat performance of Necrons up to some nasty heights. Getting plus one to your charge rolls helps you connect with those long bomb charges, or it makes sure that your average charge goes off more regularly. You're not putting a whole lot to risk. You also get many bonuses for being active in the fight phase that anytime you connect or if someone connects with you, uh, you're sure to be pumping out some serious damage. Having the ability to pump your attack characteristic for just one control point is going to make it a difficult choice when building your units on the small side or the large side, and we've got some great characters like Anrakir that can crank it up even more. Uh, the only real awkward thing for this dynasty, which isn't really a super huge deal, is the replacement of the Void Scythe for the Relic. Uh, Void Scythe cost a lot of points, so I can, so I really can't see why you'd ever downgrade your 15 points uh, to this uh, weapon when you should really just pay for a war scythe to get those extra attacks. It just seems like a clunky thing to include since all the models that can take a void scythe can also take a war scythe. Uh, I could easily see this being the dynasty that you want to spend a bunch of CP on those extra warlord traits though since blood fueled fury is so good on a fighty HQ but there are a couple of others that we'd like to have access to to get some nice bonuses into your list. Thrall of the Silent King for those Relentless March and My Will Be Done extensions are, is definitely one of those Warlord traits that I wouldn't mind having in here. I think Novak is going to be a really common dynasty, since Necrons have a lot of really good melee units, and just pumping them up here makes sure that you can kind of crush through things one after another. They don't like getting bogged down in combat, so a lot of their bonuses are wanting to keep that combat momentum moving so you can build up that tempo in game, and I think everything they do here and everything that the, the Necron Codex has from a close combat point is going to really forward that, uh, that initiative. Sawtech is the classic Necron dynasty, and at least they're classic to me. I think I started playing in 5th edition, and right then it was, you know, everywhere you look, it was the advertising on the boxes, or players locally were just Sawtech everywhere. It was the metal in black and green. I feel like that's like classic Necrons, right? And uh, their first dynastic code bonus is that they can re-roll their failed morale tests. They also allow rapid fire to work at 18 inches instead of their normal half distance. Also, when the Conquering Tyrant protocol comes up, uh, you get to utilize both modes. Directive 1 adds 3 inches tall auras, uh, Lord's Will and My Will Be Done, and Rites of Reanimation. Those all go up to 12 inches, uh, but I guess up to 12 inches max. Directive 2 lets you shoot in a turn and you fell back, but subtracts 1 from those hit rolls. The Sawtech Stratagem Methodical Destruction works in the shooting phase for two command points after a Sawtech unit has attacked. You pick a unit that they shot at, and each other unit that shoots at them adds one to their attack roll. The Vanquisher's Mask is the Sawtech Relic, and can go anywhere a relic could normally go. Uh, this relic happens to let you choose one enemy model within three inches of the bear, and then that selected unit cannot fight until all units from your army have done so. Hyperlogical Strategist is the Sawtech Warlord trait, and it lets you roll a die each time you spend a command point for a stratagem, and on a 5 you'll get that command point back. The final bonus for the Sawtech Dynasty is that you get access to three character HQs that won't break your dynastic code since they have the Sawtech keyword baked into their profile. You get access to Imotech, Vargard Oberon, and Nemesir Zandrik. So Sawtech is a strange one. I believe they're going for this strategically focused style of play, but I feel like this dynasty has a little bit of a well-rounded sense to it. There's defense against morale issues, a few buffs to shooting, some combat control, and some interesting characters. Uh, Xandric has a neat way of buffing things that your unit needs through the Transient Madness ability. Oberyn gives you a unique combat piece with some neat synergy between the Lord's Will and My Will Be Done from Xandric. And Imotech is just a value piece with a once-per-game megabolt that he's, that he's going to get some work done with. 
but he's got some great personal output in shooting and combat, and also has some big returns on command points. You get two just for taking him, and then Feyron is built into his profile, so you're saving those command points as well if that's something that you typically would spend points to do. I think Hyperlogical Strategist will be taken a lot with the Dynasty, and mostly Immotech, since you aren't getting a ton of Dynasty buffs uh, that some of the other dynasty u- Dynasties use to move their army towards a certain goal or playstyle. You'll find yourself relying on a lot of those base stratagems from the Necron book to increase your army's output, so the chance to get some of those command points back is going to be a really big deal. Without insulting the Dynasty, Uh, This one is probably the closest to vanilla in the Codex. It's not really good or bad, it just is. And that being said, I think it's flexible and it's definitely worth exploring. The Silent King's dynasty, the Zerikin dynasty, gives all models in this code a 5 plus save against mortal wounds and allows a unit to reroll one wound from a shooting or melee attack. This dynasty activates both directives of the Undying Legion's command protocol. Directive 1 allows each model to regain one additional wound off of living metal, and Directive 2 allows you to reroll one reanimation protocol die when a unit's reanimation protocols are activated. The Zerikin dynasty brings the unique stratagem Empiric Dampening. For one command point, if any psychic power is cast within 18 inches of a Zerikin unit, you can deny that power on a 4 plus on 1d6. The Sovereign Coronal is the dynasty's relic that can be equipped to any Zerikin noble and gives two abilities. The first is the Command Wave Amplifier, and this increases the bearer's command protocol range from 6 to 9. The ability is worded a bit awkwardly because it almost double states what it does. If your unit is within 9 of the noble wearing the coronal, then they're within 9 of the character, and that makes the second part of this feel a little uh, unnecessarily stated. Uh, This is just clunky wording to me. I think I spent a good half hour just rereading this over and over, thinking there was something I had missed about it. Uh, But it really just could have been said that a Zerikin unit within 9 inches of the coronal uh, benefits from uh, command protocols instead of 6 inches. Let me know in the comments if there's something that I'm missing with this. Uh, this the second ability, though, is pretty straightforward. This just says while you're within 9 inches of the bear, uh, Zarek and core units benefit from both directives of your command protocol instead of just one that you pick for the turn. The Zerikin Warlord trait lets you manipulate command protocols uh, by only selecting 4 instead of 5 and letting you enact one of those protocols for a second turn when it comes up. So it, I think it has to be sequential right you can't just go back and pick one that you had before you have to pick the one that you had last turn and just do it twice the another aspect that we need to talk about with this dynasty is that the silent king so like we saw in the Sawtech characters the silent king has the zarekin faction keyword instead of the template dynasty keyword this makes sense given that it's his dynasty and everything uh, but i think he also has well i know he has dynastic agent which which excludes him from benefiting from any of the dynastic codes even though they happen to be his own i think the inclusion of his dynasty on the data sheet was more of a fluff thing than a rules thing but it seems really confusing to players and clunky that you've got to select the protocol you want active with undying when undying legion comes up even though you're all zarekin because the silent king won't benefit from both directives while the rest of the army does i can see the designers wanting not wanting him to uh, re-roll a a single wound roll or getting a five up save on morale wounds but it doesn't seem that outlandish to allow him to benefit from those given that he won't ever benefit from other dynastic codes the silent king is a phenomenal piece for the necron army and for your collection but i think they could have used a little bit more time with him in the oven when it comes to his interactions with his own dynasty Overall, I think there's a lot of strength in the Zerikin dynasty between altering the command protocols and bringing some strong psychic defense at the cost of command points instead of army points. I do think that the Zerikin dynasty might be more of a meta call when 
or with a, a big benefit to, to being defense from mortal wounds and psychic denial, but the rerolling wounds per unit plays well into this MSU or multiple small unit army building strategy, which seems to be gaining some popularity in the 40k headspace right now. This dynasty is a bit like Sawtech, but instead of having a little bit of everything, it's not really pointed in any one direction when trying to push a plan of aggression. As your meta, the game, uh, and 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 the, just the game in general changes with more releases, I could see this dynasty getting a little bit more potent, but if you really like what the command protocols do for this army, it'll be a really strong choice for you. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. I hope that if you were having some uh, trouble kind of chewing on the dynastic codes and how these work, that this helped you out a little bit. If you're looking for any more specific content in the future, feel free to put those in the comments section below. I always take a look at those and try and wrap that into future productions. But for the most part, I'm just really like interested in getting back into the 40K world. Like I had said earlier, I'd started roughly in fifth edition and it's kind of been up and down uh, in and out kind of thing for me with 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 games workshop over the career of my wargaming so i'm really enjoying the way that ninth edition plays right now and i'm still really uh hyped to make content for it i'm just tr going to try and figure out how to focus that down and if the viewers want to give me any suggestions on that i'll be happy to take them but expect more tactics discussion uh list building or list analysis unit analysis and potentially some battle reports in the future as I try to like hammer out how that works. I've done plenty of War Machine and Ice and Fire battle reports, but the 40k battle reports don't really work as well in the format that I use for those. Uh, so it it'll take some time, but it's definitely going to be something that happens in the future. Otherwise, thanks again for sticking around and I look forward to making more of this for you in the future.